Chapter 4 Hog's Bottom Secret Castle Camelot was decorated from moat to turrets in silver streamers and multicolored flags. The sun was shining and there was music floating across the, green, the castle green from the many minstrels and jesters hoping to please the crowds with tales of brave knights and their daring deeds. Brightly colored stalls flourished around the edges of the green, selling an amazing variety of trinkets. Jester hats, cauldrons, jars of potions, decorated scabbards, fried rats, tails, and toy broomsticks. There was a crowd of assorted knights and ladies weaving in and out of the stalls and children. And dragons, dogs, and other animals were diving around in their midst, getting in everyone's way. Above the castle entrance, a large banner proclaimed that it was the annual festival of magic. Mmm, roast suckling pig, said Max, sniffing the air, air appreciatively as smells of cooking food wafted across from numerous campfires. He, Olivia, and their parents were approaching the castle entrance slowly, <clears throat> fighting their way through the crowds with Adolphus held tightly on a strong lead. They had rooms in the castle itself since Sir Bertram was a distant cousin of King Arthur, but Max was slightly envious of the families camped around the castle in their bright tents enjoying the sunshine. When they got to the entrance, they were stopped by two rather surly-looking guards. "'Pass, please,' said one of them in a bored voice holding out his hand. "'Pass?' roared Sir Bertram. "'Pass? Don't you know who I am?' You good-for-nothing scurvy sons of kitchen wenches. What do you mean, pass? The guard looked up and squinted. Oh, uh, yes, good day, Sir Bertram, he said nervously. Orders, I'm afraid. All visitors to show passes. No exceptions whatsoever. It's on account of having the young princeling here, you know. The son of the Cornish king. He lowered his voice a fraction and said, They do say as how there's a plot to do away with him while he's here. And of course, that'll mean war. The Cornish are looking for any excuse to invade as it is. And if anything happens to the young prince while he's under the king's protection, well, that's all the excuse they'll need. So, if you don't mind, said the other guard, holding out his hand in turn, pass, please. He took a step backward as Sir Bertram swelled visibly. But before his face had time to turn the color of a ripe tomato which Max knew was the danger point, Lady Griselda whipped out a piece of creamy parchment from her robes and handed it over. I think you'll find this is what you need, she said sweetly. Don't fuss, Bertram, she's added, turning towards her husband. You know they need to be extra careful. Absolute nonsense, muttered Sir Bertram. Dashed insult, that's what I call it. Balderdash and poppycock and he consented to let the guards examine the pass before sweeping them all into the castle and up to their rooms at the top of the North Tower. Lady Griselda tur started bustling about, unpacking cauldrons and spell ingredients and her best robes, and Sir Bertram stomped off to find some friends to join him in a practice round for the knight who can quaff the most grog in a single swallow competition, which he generally won. Max winked at Olivia, and they set to work, helping to unpack in the most unhelpful way possible, with the biggest number of annoying questions they could think of. Meanwhile, Adolphus flew around the room, getting periodically tangled up in the tapestries. After five minutes, Lady Griselda had enough. Oh, for goodness sakes, go and practice your spells or something and leave me in peace. I'll be quicker by myself. And take that dratted dragon with you. Thanks, Mum, said Max, happily dumping the pile of clothes he was holding. And they set off down the turret staircase, with Adolphus skittering down the stone steps behind them. They headed straight for the west wing, where they knew there was always empty rooms. Merlin lived in this part of the castle, and most people were keen to avoid any confrontation with the extremely powerful wizard. Max, however, thought everything he'd heard about Merlin was brilliant and was always hoping he would run into the wizard so he could finally meet him and tell him so. But so far, he never had. Right, said Max, as they settled into a small room with narrow windows off the fourth floor corridor. It was empty except for some old tapestries on the wall and a few bits of wooden furniture. Time to practice the frog spell antidote and check that the reversal works. They had brewed up the general reversal spell the day before, as well as some carefully controlled frog spell potion, but they had not had time to test them before leaving for Camelot. The novices' spell-making competition was the next day, right at the end of the festival, so they had a day and a half to perfect their act. So, said Max, pulling one of his hunting gloves onto his right hand, 
<clears throat> if you'll just stand there in the middle of the room. I'm sorry, said Olivia, pretending great surprise. Were you intending to try this out on me? Yes, on you, said Max slowly and deliberately. Seeing as you're my assistant and seeing as assistants test potions, not wizards. Well, said Olivia, folding her arms and looking very determined, since you're not exactly a wizard, Max, and seeing as I'm doing you a very great favor by agreeing to be your assistant tomorrow, I think it's probably down to you to test your own potion today. I'm not getting turned into a pink elephant with green spots because you got one of the ingredients wrong, thank you. Max sighed. That was the trouble with younger sisters. They'd be fine for a while, almost like they were completely trustworthy. Then they'd let you down when you really needed them. Drat! He would just have to take the smelly potion himself then. All right, he said, taking off his glove and holding it to her along with a translucent green glass bottle on a chain. Here's the antidote to change me back and a glove to wear when you hold the frog spell po potion. We wouldn't want you to have accidentally get changed into a frog now, would we? He carefully took a small blue bottle out of his belt pouch and shook Ferocious out at the same time. Oh, don't tell me, said Ferocious as he tumbled to the stone floor. You're about to voluntarily spell yourself into a frog, as if you don't cause enough didn't cause enough trouble the last time. Some people never learn. You know, sometimes I miss the days when I couldn't understand you, Ferocious, said Max, sighing. This is important. It's going to get me out of sword practice for good and maybe save me from getting my arm chopped off in one of Dad's matter moments. Besides, making snotty hog's bottom eat dirt. And it'll be fun, added Adolphus excitedly. Max will go whoosh in stars. Oh, right. Well, wake me up when the antidote doesn't work and I'll consider giving you a big wet rat kiss. And with that, Ferocious curled up behind one of the trailing tapestries and went to sleep. Right, said Max and took a deep breath. Pat my glove, put my glove on and hold out your hand. He shook one little drop of blue gunk out of the bottle onto Olivia's gloved hand and then stowed the bottle in his pouch. Olivia threw the blue gunk at Max's head. Bang! He disappeared and in his place was a small orange fro frog with blue spots. Arg! he said. I'd forgotten how weird it is being changed into a frog. Okay, said Olivia. That worked. Now for the antidote. She took the stopper out of the green bottle and prepared to shake a few drops onto the frog. But at that moment, the door to the room opened and a loud sneering voice interrupted them. Well, if it isn't little Olivia Pendragon in here all by herself. How nice to see you again. And where's your good-for-nothing brother? The boy in the doorway was tall and pale with spiky black hair and an expression of contempt. Behind him was a shorter, stockier boy with red hair and a pug face. His eyes were slightly squinting and he looked mean. Oh, hello, Sn... Uh, I mean, Adrian, said Olivia nervously, putting the stopper back in the green bottle and throwing it hurriedly around her neck. What are you doing here? She shuffled across in front of the frog, hoping Max would get a chance to hop under her skirt, but the movement caught Snotty Hogsbottom's attention and he dived for the floor. Ah, he said, coming up with the orange frog held firmly between finger and thumb. What a delightful creature, your pet, Olivia. Uh, yes, said Olivia. Give him back, please. I need to uh, get back to our rooms to help Mother. Oh, I expect you do, drawled Snotty in a bored voice. But you see, I have some questions for you, and I don't feel like letting you have your frog back unless you answer them. Isn't that right, Jerome? The shorter boy nodded and moved closer. Olivia was now trapped between the two of them. Adolphus, not quite sure what was going on, had been sniffing around the boy's feet, but he now decided they were friends and went to hunt woodlice in the corner, waving his tail happily. Well, okay, said Olivia, trying not to sound bothered. What do you want to know? I want to know where your dratted brother is and what spell he's cooking up for tomorrow. I want to know exactly what spell because I want to make sure it doesn't win. And to make a counter charm, I need to know what it's for, see? said Snotty nastily, putting his face close to Olivia's and waving the frog in front of her. Max, despite being held in a pincher grip, wriggled his back legs in outrage. No wonder his bucket spell hadn't worked last year. Snotty Hogsbottom had been operating a counter charm. The dirty, rotten, cheating scumbag. I'm not telling you, said Olivia hotly. You horrible cheat. Why should I sneak on my own brother? 
because, said Snotty meaningfully, if you don't, I shall be forced to drop your frog into the moat, and I've heard there's six feet long pike in it. He moved to the window and held his arm out over the water. Olivia could see Max shaking his frog head frantically. But did that mean? No, don't tell him. I'd rather die. Or, no, don't let him drop me in the moat. Tell him everything. I'm not proud. Hmm. Olivia sighed. All right, you win. He's planning to turn me. The frog croaked loudly and frantically waved its back legs. Purple, finished Olivia. And Max sighed with relief, but not for long. Purple, laughed Snotty. What a loser. That's the easiest spell in the book. I guess he really doesn't have any ambition after all. Well, thanks, he added carelessly and opened his finger and thumb so that the small orange frog dropped like a stone to the gray water 50 feet below. <gasps> you cheating to toadwort, yelled Olivia, hurling herself at Snotty. But Jerome had her pinned to the wall quicker than you could say drowned frog, and Snotty walked calmly past her with a chuckle. Oh dear, my hand slipped. But what a fuss about old frog. Plenty more in the castle duck pond. As he passed her, Snotty sprinkled around a few drops of liquid from a flask hanging from his belt, and Olivia found herself completely unable to move a muscle in her arms or her legs. She slid down the wall to a sitting position with a thump as the two boys strolled from the room laughing loudly. Come on, Jerome, she heard Snotty say as they shut the door with a loud thud. Need to practice, need to do some sword practice. And then it'll be time to get that brat away from the castle for father. Oh no. What's going to happen next? Poor, uh, what's his name? Max is down in the, in the moat. 